Hi, Jim here, just dropping in before this week's episode to tell you about my latest movie, The Apocalypse Box. It's a horror film and I'd love for you to check it out. If you go to apocalypsebox.co.uk, you can find all the links on where you can watch the movie. Right, let's get on with this week's episode. Hi, Jim here, and you're listening to the Honest Filmmaker podcast, career advice from people in the business. This week, I'm speaking to director and animator Will Beecher. Will is a director and a creative at Ardman in Bristol. He joined the animation team on Wallace and Gromit at the Curse of the Were-Rabbit, becoming one of Ardman's youngest ever feature film animators. Will has since worked on series and commercials and feature films as lead character animator. He also directed the Shaun of the Sheep movie, Farmageddon. I talked to Will about how he got into the industry. We chatted about some of the amazing projects he's worked on while he's been at Ardman. He also talked me through what it was like directing a stop motion feature film. And he told me about the Ardman Academy. Enjoy. I'll start where I start with most people. Did you uh, go to university? Did you study? How did you get into animation? Um, yes, I did. I went off to study at Edinburgh College of Arts. And um, it was one of the few courses at the time that seemed to teach whatever type of animation you wanted to do. So I've always sort of been a massive fan of stop motion. That was very much, you know, what I had in my mind when I went there to try and get a job eventually somewhere like Hardman. And um, it was a three year course up in Scotland, loved it every minute of it. And it was really a sort of filmmaking course actually, rather than a, it was called animation, but we learned everything about making short films. Cool. And you, by the looks of your IMDb, you, after that course, you did a couple of short films, did you? Is that what you moved on to yeah. next? Yeah, I am. Um, so I did. A bit, I managed to get a bit of work experience at Ardman throughout my degree. So in the summer holidays, basically, I would come down to Bristol and I'd, I'd be sort of pressing out chicken wings or um, making eyeballs, that kind of thing. Um, and then when I graduated, I made a short film in order to get work, you know, more work at Ardman. And in those in-between jobs, which, you know, I I had quite a few of at the beginning, I just wanted to make stuff. And so, yeah, these short films sort of came from that, really. They came from a bit of space, but also the desire to keep learning and and sort of developing. Wow. And um, when you actually got that job at Ardman, what was that like? I mean, it was was just a mixture of terror, fear, um, massive excitement. Um, I still remember very vividly the day I sort of came in through the doors and it's such a it's such a sort of you don't know like everything in the film industry you sort of don't know what it's like inside the studio because no one goes there it's not like they don't have open days so I just remember this the smell and the which was um, weirdly it was like a mixture of baby wipes and clay Uh, and and, um, I also just remember thinking this is like this feels like college because everyone here they're like five years older than I am but they just have this sort of energy about them and this um, vibe that I loved straight away I felt very much at home here. And do you because the thing I always wonder about the Ardman stuff is there like a bible or do you get debriefed or is there a rule book because it it's all got that sort of same vibe so how is how do they make sure that it does? Yeah, that's that's a really good question. I mean, t- so I've worked here now for, a, a, well, just over 20 years. And I think uh, it has changed, you know, a lot in that time in terms of the scale. So when Arben first started back in the 70s, it was very much, you know, three or four filmmakers who all had a similar sensibility, although one was quite surreal and, and you know, but they loved humour. And I think that tied everything they did together. They were all working in stop motion with clay. Nothing, nowhere else really in the world was doing it. There was one or two studios in America. So I guess it, it was born from that. Mm. Um, and and then as things got bigger and bigger, they needed to start creating sort of rules. And, and my boss, the head of animation, Lloyd Price, he was here, you know, really early on and started to sort of train people up. So... They went from just four sort of schoolboy filmmakers who had ideas for films who were doing everything themselves to a a feature film company back in 2000 with Chicken Run. Mm -hmm. And that was when they sort of, for the first time, they had to really massively scale up. Um, And the Bible is something, so on the last project I've just finished, I was working on um, Wallace and Gromit, which Mm -hmm. is coming out at Christmas. 
and it was my job as a supervisor to create that same Bible for the animators. Um, 35 animators, all with a lot of knowledge about Aardman styles, um, but some of whom have not worked with Wallace and Gromit before, some of whom have, and I have to sort of tie all that together in one document um, that, that explains everything from how they blink, you know, how long you might hold a pose for to w what looks right and wrong, you know, mm -hmm. down to the tiniest little bit of clay on a, on a, on a curve on an ear. And um, looking back on the stuff that you've done, just to understand, because animation is something I do not know anything about, logistics-wise, do you are you making the things or are you just moving the things? How, what you know on these different roles? What, how does it all work? Yeah, on a feature film, it's very much everyone has a specialism. So the animation team won't be making any of the puppets. We've got a whole puppet team. Um, we've got an art department who who build the sets and the props. Puppet team build everything to do with the, the actual characters. Um, and then cameras, lighting, you know, it's, it's a huge team. So the animators themselves, um, they are given a puppet and what they have to do is create the performance from that. So they're purely animating, but there is a bit of, um, well, there's a lot of sculpting involved as well. So the animators are and generally have to understand clay and how it works and how to move it. and. You know, when an animator's working, it would be it could be they're on their own in their unit for a day or a week or even several weeks just physically animating. If something goes wrong with a puppet or the set or or the lights, we've got this resourceful team. You know, at the end of a walkie-talkie, who'll come and fix stuff. Um, but if you go away from features, you very quickly become a bit more of a generalist. So, someone making a commercial, for example, or a series. You just have to get on and do more yourself. It's it's much more like everyone mucks in, mm. and people love that as well. You know, it's quite it's part of the variety that makes it interesting. Yeah, and you've also done. Correct me if I'm wrong here, because again, this is not my area. Uh, so, would you on a big feature film might you be responsible for one particular character? Sort of, yeah. So we we tend to um, start small. So using, you know, Wallace and Gromit as an example, we start with just the directors and myself uh, and the other heads of department. And then as we get towards production, we'll start bringing in a couple of animators who are the, sort of the most experienced character animators and they will do the development work. Um, that will all feed into the Bible. And we're sort of finding, even though they're established characters at Artman, every film we make, we've got new processes, we've got new types of performance so we're really refining the characters each time and then those animators generally you know they might click with a certain character and they'll become the character lead and all the way through the shoot every animator will probably animate every single character but our character leads will will do the sort of the most important shots mm. they're the ones that the directors just know if there's a if there's a complicated thing to create with a certain character we go to them first. So it's like you, you very much cast the animators like actors. You're like, this person is really good at, you know, menacing, tiny movements, very tightly sculpted, Feathers McGraw. You know, there's only maybe five or six of the animation team that we would naturally put into those shots. And then looking at, so obviously you directed the Shaun the Sheep movie. Um, which was a big deal in this house with my kids back when it came out. Um, so you're directing, so I understand I can talk to an actor and I can get them to elicit certain performances. How on earth do you direct something that takes so long to come together? Yeah, I mean, again, I it's a good question because we don't really consider it because we've been we've been learning the process like since since day one, I guess, since um, you know Pete and Dave first did their first bit of performance and then started to delegate. You basically learn all the tools there are in order to sort of direct performance through animators. Um, so one of the things we would do is we quite often record a live action video. So the directors will go into a unit with a video camera. They'll do a sort of, and there's some clips of these online. There's some really funny ones with uh, Nick Park dressed as a, a hog. Um, but essentially it's like a, it's a really quick way of establishing what the performance is going to be. 
and it's a great way to discuss it because then the animator is going to go off and animate it and it's so organic the process of moving a puppet frame by frame you can never repeat it the same way twice but also you can interpret the same piece of performance loads of different ways just like an actor would so a lot of it's just that conversation between the directors and the animators like before the shot starts um, and the other thing which we do a lot is we we create the whole film in storyboards like really quite detailed to the point where they're semi-animated and that allows us to sort of you know the, the whole crew then refer to that we call it the animatic we refer to that as a way of of knowing what the context is for every shot because we're shooting out of order quite often we've got 40 different units so 40 different locations uh, half of them are going to have Wallace in them so all at the same time we've got 40 different locations in the film different points in the film it's it's like a part of the biggest challenge when you're directing is just to be able to walk from one location in the film to another and know exactly what is going on mm -hmm. at that point it must go wrong sometimes so does it do you, is there ever a situation where you i mean i don't know if you can get this far down the line where a scene comes in it's 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 been put together and it's like oh this isn't quite right start again or what how do you approach that yeah it does happen of course and it's a sort of creative process and it's actually part of the in a way it's a benefit of animation and stop motion because you have a bit more time so whereas on live action you might film a scene you probably do it a couple of times you'd have multiple cameras we build we build the plan we build the the, the sort of animatic storyboard and we refine it and refine it and refine it to the point where we know which shot is going to go where and how long it lasts to the to the frame mm. not to the second to the actual frame um and so most of the time you can sort of get a sense of how that scene is working just by watching the storyboard but we're constantly editing refining uh, and it's been really interesting watching nick and merlin work on this film from this angle, so I've directed and I've worked as an animator and now I'm sitting in between those two roles with the directors quite a lot, seeing how they work and then with the animators, seeing how they interpret that brief. Um, and so what is brilliant, which, which I've taken from this job, is that you, you're never really finished. You're never, like, you don't just lock it and go, that's it, that's what we're going to shoot every single stage is an opportunity to sort of finesse and improve and tweak to the point where the animators might be shooting something they might have an idea they'll talk they'll get nick or merlin to come into the unit discuss it and yeah if it seems like it'll work that then goes into the shot and same with props um same with sort of gags anything and then and then the edit comes together so we replace the animatic with those shots as they happen and there's a sort of constant edit. Like the edit team work on these films, they're the first in, the last out, and they're working all the way through and they're always editing. So in the fine cut, you get the, the more, you know, you get to look uh, as a whole, a whole film and sort of, yeah, say that that scene isn't right. And we had it on Farmageddon, we've had it on every film. There's always crunch points where something's not right and yeah, we lose stuff, you know, we might cut, we might cut a whole scene. It's unlikely because mm. normally we'd know before we got to the end of shooting it all, but it does happen and it always is hard for the animators. And, you know, I really see that on this film. You do a performance as an animator, you're putting your heart out there, you're like, a, you are acting it. Mm. It's, it's painfully slow, you get through it, you present it and there's that nervous thing, does it work, does it not work? And if it gets cut, it's just, it's like, it's just, it could have taken weeks, probably took months, you know, mm -hmm. what with the build and the, the, um, all the work from all the crew that go into it. So yeah, it's a, it's a bitter pill, but everyone I think understands that it makes the film better. And that's the most important thing. If, if animation comes out, it's not because the animation's bad. It's because the story works better without it. I'm assuming there's not many people like you about there's not many people who've directed an animated stop motion feature film would that be right um it's a niche i suppose in that you know someone like Ardman, a very big company we've got other companies like you know Leica um, and companies that 
come together for the Tim Burton films or the Wes Anderson films, they're all stop motion. They all have a similar sort of collection of people that, that work on them. But I suppose it is a small, you know, you, you can count it on two hands, mm. possibly. No, I mean, it's under, it's around 20 people, I guess. Mm. Um, and the animation team are very unique, you know, so there aren't that many animators in the world. We can't just look through a directory and pick more. We literally, we, we know most of the animators working in the industry and they tend to move around to the jobs. So, you know, we, we work with people who are now in America and a lot of European animators come here. So it is quite a specialism um, to get to this level of animation. And would you say um, careers wise, is there, is there space for new people in that, in that environment? Is there, is there, are you looking for people or is it a case of, oh, we've only got so many spots? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I would say it's highly competitive. Um, and it always has been. And I'm always on the brink of like, is there going to be another film? You know, like literally since the day I graduated, I've been like, I'm on a film. Hooray, I'm on a film. I can't believe it. And then the film finishes and like, is there going to be another film? Um, it has, for me, you know, it's been a consistent career and a lot of the people I work with, um, but it's a freelance industry. So it's not like, you know, there's a lot of colleges teaching animation, um, but not necessarily the skill set that we would require. Um, and, you know, to go to go back, yes, there are opportunities because we're always, there is a sort of cycle in that animators that worked a long time become directors or they go off and write or, you know, there is a sort of natural progression um, and we use we do see quite a few junior animators coming in at the you know the lower end doing their making their chicken wings and, and making the eyes. It's just slow you know slow progression, but there's definitely space for more. Mm. And I mean the what I'm part of now, my most recent sort of development has been to do more with the Artman Academy, mm. which is a an in-house sort of training scheme to help develop and diversify the industry a bit so it's been really nice to sort of see the enthusiasm and the talent because ultimately if you're talented and you can do the job then you, you you're going to probably find work because there aren't hundreds of people that do it and you know, that do it really well yeah um so talking about the academy Tell me a little bit about it. Is it, can anyone do it? Is it something you need to have certain qualifications to get into? How's it all work? Yeah, it is. So the way it's been set up. So Mark, Simon Hewis became a sort of head of the Armand Academy a few years ago. It's open to anyone in the world. So I think what makes it unique is that it, 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 there are no barriers of age or location. You can be a part of it. There's certain elements of it that you can do online. Um, and there's sort of online animation courses. There are other courses, but the, the online animation courses are where uh, someone will sign up. They'll then do a sort of 12 week training course. Essentially, they get sent a, an armature and uh, the software that they need, and they'll set up in their own home and basically animate through these different tasks. And then they'll have a mentor from Artman, one of the animators at Artman, who will check in every week and sort of give them feedback. So that's a really nice thing because it feels like we're sharing some of the Artman sort of know-how, but with people in other countries who potentially will help improve the industry around the world. Um, and then there's another side to it, which is the side I'm involved with, which is, again, open to anyone. Um, it's not qualification-based. It's all about the level of work, your, your portfolio. Um, but I'm currently running these in-studio courses, so like a five-week purely animation training where people come in. We've got 12 students at the moment um, who've, who've basically come into the studio and we've built a, a sort of academy area where they, they can learn. And I'm there, you know, showing them what we do and how we do it. And they're then working on their own performance and their own technique. Yeah, and the the biggest thing that, that started last year is a filmmaking course. So it's called In Studio Stop Motion. It's an eight-month course, mm. six months of which is actually in the studio. 
And the people that come to that basically have to apply with a film idea. So they're applying with a film idea and then coming and making it in the sort of support and the environment of Ardman using some of the, you know, we have writers and puppet makers and art directors. It's all really about teaching the individual how to make films using the knowledge that we have here. So it's quite, it's very exciting. I mean, it's, it's new to me. It's, I'm, I'm sort of five weeks in, um, but it ties in very much with my experience of being at Ardman in that I've always learnt and everyone's always teaching everyone else here. So it's really lovely to, to actually be able to share a bit wider. And, and can you tell when you meet one of the students, is there a certain personality type that suits this sort of work? Can you, can you tell instinctively you're like, oh, if this person's, they've got it or not? <laughs> Not, not really. No, I mean it would be great if he could. Um, it probably would have made Lloyd's job easier for the last twenty years. Mm -hmm. But um, it's funny, you know, animators are a, a really interesting bunch of people because some of them are really introverted and really quiet and shy, and then they do this most amazing, you know, elaborate performance on screen. Whereas you also get very, you know, out there people, quirky, funny. Um, they're also very good on screen, so you can't tell necessarily. But I think everyone who's been successful has been generally easy to work with. That is a big part of it, like anything in filmmaking. Mm -hmm. you've, you're animating on your own, but you've got to work in a team really well. And you've got to communicate well. And you've got to understand other people. And, you know, you've got to have the technical knowledge of how much things move and when and how. But much more important than that is the actual sort of your, your acting ability. Um, that's the thing that sets out the really top end features animators. They are excellent actors and you can't always see that in the way they talk. Mm. <laughs> you know, some of them, there's an, there's an animator, um, I'm sure she won't mind, Alison Evans, who's been here for, you know, a long time. I think we both started around Wear Rabbit and she's very, um, you know, she's, she's just, Perfectly normal person, very quiet. You know, you, you give her a brief, she'll say, yes, yeah, I can do that, do that, yeah, sure. There's no fuss. You can give her anything and she can just deliver the most amazing animation. It's just impossible. You wouldn't know that by looking at her. But we've got a whole team like that. They're all different. Everyone's completely different mm. in terms of personality. Yeah. So it's interesting, um, interesting to think. I mean, people think you have to be patient to be an animator. Mm -hmm. I think that's a little bit of a red herring because mm -hmm. animators actually aren't that patient quite often. Oh, really? Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think when you're animating, you're, you're lost in the moment. So you're not, you're not aware of the time because you're concentrating so much on something. You know, it it's really takes a lot of concentration. Um, but, but, you know, there's not many egos in the animation business especially in stop motion so that's nice you know there's everyone's quite down to earth and yeah no one's no one's pushing anyone else out of the way for work it's just a, it's a it's a family really um it feels like that over the years and just thinking about patience um so if i go into a studio i'm doing a character i'm doing a scene i'm spending a day in there how how much screen time do i get out of <laughs> that day can i actually watch it back that day i mean how much do i get yeah yeah i mean we'll we'll take the first frame of a shot that's one twelfth of a second so generally the average for our animation team is five seconds a week each right so that's what we're aiming for yeah um two seconds a day is what we sort of two to three seconds a day is what we'd hope for when we're shooting. Mm -hmm. And then there's all the other times where we're setting up, prepping, you know, testing, rehearsing. So that is a feature film. You know, you're going to work for a day. You might at the end of it have just under two seconds of footage. You can watch it. Um, it's a snippet, but you build it and build it and build it over, over weeks. Uh, it's like a, it's like doing a, painting or something you're like mm. slowly adding it takes hours so you add and add and add and then suddenly it's finished and you're like ah oh. <laughs> but um uh if you're working on a series you could actually shoot you know five to ten seconds a day mm. so really quite a decent amount um because it's just 
the level of performance is, is you know, it's, it's not going to have to hold up on a big screen. It, it's going to be watched once or twice. Having said that, like the Ardman projects like Sean get watched over and over oh, again, but there's, <laughs> there's just something, there's something energy. You have to shoot fast mm -hmm. with those. Um, it's just, it's locked into the budget. We just can't afford to take any longer. So, yeah. Cool. And then, um, so I'm, so say I'm leaving, I've done my A-levels, I'm leaving, uh, I'm thinking about a uni course, I'm looking at the Ardman Academy. What's the, what's the best things I can do for myself to sort of give me the best chance in this industry? Mm. I, well, it's the advice I have because I had exactly the same sort of quandary. You know, I, I when I first got my foot in the door at Ardman, I was just to everyone, I was like, how did you get here? What What would you advise me to do? And mainly people just said you just need to practice that's the, the one thing there is a bit more you know knowledge out there on the internet about how to do it um i think practicing and building up a portfolio is is critical and you could do that at university i mean university gives you an environment surrounded by other people doing the same thing so that's what that offers um the Arban academy the, the different parts of it deliver sort of like insight and technical skills um and it's yeah it's what you want to do is i think the number one thing is try and understand the industry as much as you can and know where it is you want to go because when i graduated i made a short film which sold me exclusively as an animator i mean that was the purpose of it it's like i'm not going to make it too ambitious i'm going to set it, a character in a room and it's all about performance. And for me, that was the key thing. If I'd wanted to go into props, uh, production, you know, any any other side of it, that's what I'd have needed to do to focus on. And I think, you know, that some of the other jobs around animation aren't so well known. Mm. Um, we're trying to make it clearer what the jobs are, but if you watch the credits of a feature film, there are 250 people and 30 of them are animators you know, a tiny amount, really, there are so many skills involved. So, yeah, research is, is the thing, like, research, and then if that's what I want to do, what skills do I need to get there? Mm. And then you just r work on those skills, I would say. Yeah. And I also noticed on Shaun the Sheep, I think it was the movie, you've got some voice credits. So... <laughs> So what? What did you, how 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 did you end up being a voice on the film, and what did you actually voice? I've got this this sort of slightly sad desire to do voices, which I quite often do around the studio, and and I think to the point where, you know, Nick, <laughs> Nick and Merlin, I I did quite a few of the voices in the early stages of edit, and um, none of them quite stuck, mm. but. I just like doing voices. It's just, it entertains me, different voices, like impressions. But what we do in the process of making any film is it's the crew that provide the voice soundtrack first. Mm -hmm. So when we do the animatic, it's the crew. Normally someone in edit or a couple of people in edit, they're very good uh, actors. And then the directors will do a lot as well. Um, and then once that sort of storyboard is lot, is it's like, yes, that's working then we go off and record the actual proper actors mm. and that's what the animators work to so they, so we always have the finished voices before the animators shoot mm. um so on farmageddon it just happened that myself and rich who were directing you know we we provided the snails that was um the the two snails mm -hmm. there was one tall and thin one one shorter one um th that was us yeah and then we also did some of the hazmats which are the sort of yeah, the, the army of white, white sort of clad. Oh, sorry, not white. They're um, yeah, they're in the hazmat yellow hazmat outfits. Mm -hmm. They we needed a, a sort of group of voices, so we did some of those, um, and it stuck because I guess you go for the best voice for the character. So that's exactly what we needed. Mm. Uh, yeah, we. And we do hundreds of takes. I mean, it's like, it's insane. If you, you assume you go and record a voice actor and you say, you're going to be Sean the Sheep. Can you, can you do a bar as if you've just seen someone falling off the edge of something and then um, 
200 bars later, you go back to, to you know, the edit room, you pick through them all and one is right. <laughs> so it's just a very, um, it's a very lengthy process, but a really important part of the Harvard films. Mm. Partly, you know, because often there isn't actual dialogue. So those sounds become even more important. Um, right. So I've just got a couple of fun questions now I ask, he says, fun questions. Um, so in your opinion, what's the best animated film ever made? Oh, um, I love, uh, can I give you one sp stop frame one and one 2D? Yep. I think, so my, my favourite stop frame film is Nightmare Before Christmas. Um, Good it's choice. It's just, I just, it was the moment in my life where I fell in love with animation and I'd gone to this film festival in Cardiff and um, it was an animation festival and they premiered this this film there and I sat there and just everything about it, the, the, the lights, the music, the character, it was just a really wonderful thing and it's become such a sort of cult film. But for the stop motion community, it's still one of the best animated films uh, in terms of performance. It's just brilliant. Um, and, and 2D, it's got to be The Lion King, the original sort of Disney Lion King. I just, again, I think I love the, the energy of it, the vibrancy. And for me, both those two films, they really do what animation is capable of. They create characters and worlds that just wouldn't work for me in any other medium. It's mm -hmm. like, it's the perfect way to create this experience, this story and these characters. So yeah. I love both of those. Yeah. Big Nightmare Before Christmas fan. Let's pray to whoever God you believe in that they never try and do a live action. They just need to leave it alone. Yes. Leave it alone. Yeah. I don't mind. Yes. It. I'd, I'd wear a sequel. I'll watch a sequel if it's stop motion, but please don't make a live action version. No, definitely not. Um, and my last question, which I ask most of my guests, is have you got a motto? Um, have I got a motto? Well, I don't, I don't carry around a motto. Although I'm thinking if I had a really good one, I should probably have it tattooed somewhere. Mm. But um, <laughs> I think it's going to be... I'm, can I make one up? You can I'm, make one I'm up, struggling. yeah, yeah. Let's pretend this is... <laughs> Do I, have, I don't have one, like, in my head. It I'm might like, be... It might be a, some people have them... I guess it's more of a thing that you... An approach to life or an approach to yes. work. Yes, yeah, OK. Well, I do, yeah, I do have that. I think my approach is to always enjoy the moment. Um, and, you know, it can be very stressful filmmaking, but there is, it's just the best, you know, I do feel like the luckiest person alive sometimes to be in this environment, working in this industry. And so it's just to enjoy, soak it up and enjoy every minute. I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you'd like to hear from more industry professionals, how they got into the business and how you can do the same, or you just want to listen to some cool stories from movie sets around the world, then please do subscribe to the Honest Filmmaker podcast.